Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me today to have Honorable Justice Ranjan Gogoi uh, as a panelist. We have decided on the topic judiciary in the digital age, but uh, don't go strictly by the title of the discussion or interaction today. Uh, what we meant by judiciary in the digital age is basically judiciary today. Uh, and, you know, Justice Gogoi is one of the finest legal minds in the country. He has already been introduced very briefly, but that was only a brief introduction. And I'm sure in front of this audience, he needs no introduction at all. I would like to know whether do judges watch news? I'm asking you this question, you know, the media, whether it is television or digital today, give hours and hours of coverage, hours and hours of airtime on high profile cases, the bringing panelists to argue in favor of the case and argue against the case, uh, you know, and, and many, and at times there are anchors will also deliver the verdict uh, on television studios. And my question is whether you look at it as a media trial, uh, but the bigger question is, does it influence the judiciary? Do judges actually watch news? Did you watch news? That's a very interesting question. I don't think uh, most of the judges would have the time either to read the newspapers or to watch TV. Uh, if they do, in many cases, it would be at the cost of judicial work. People think that uh, judicial work is uh, court work from 9 to 5. How mistaken. Judicial work is 24-7. It's not judicial work, it's a commitment. It's a passion. You wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, remember a point, come down to the bedroom, jot down that point, look at it when you are on the table at 8 o'clock in the morning. Therefore, when you read the newspapers, except the funny headlines, maybe, I think uh, it will be at the cost of your work, your morning preparation for the day's work in court. Similarly, in the evening, like very diligent students of the nursery class, you will find 90% of the judges doing their homework. You have to read up the briefs of the next day, 50, 60 cases of the next day. There is no time to look into the day news channels. But once in a while during the vacation, during a holiday, when you can squeeze in a little time, you do watch. It's interesting. People are interested in what is happening. People want to extend justice. They want to break a few of cases. And, understandable. And, understandable. And what do you think about the performance of the anchors when they have a media trial? How can I say anything except that the performance is brilliant? <laughs> uh, they, are, they, they have read up. I, I realize that they have come to bed. It's not that they are talking on TNA, they have come to bed, they have done their homework. I may agree with the views expressed, I may not agree with the views expressed. That's a different matter. Yeah. But it's a view expressed, it deserves respect. And therefore, I think the anchors are doing a brilliant job. They are bringing into focus. Uh, Certain so areas that even the judges don't uh, visualize. It's a big help at times. Absolutely. That is coming from you. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that is a pat on the back. But let me tell you, uh, must be, uh, there's no media trial. There's no, a conclusion on certain facts that was be may have. And he happens to be a media person, and therefore he is on the screen. Where else can he be? It's an expression of an opinion. We don't try here. Well, uh, judges are made of uh, much external stuff. They're not soft people who would uh, be influenced by a little 10 minutes of very hard talk. Therefore, there is no media trial, there is no media uh, conclusion. It, it, these are all aids to information. Absolutely. Now, you know, it is 35 years since India became uh, independent. We are celebrating Azadi Kamalit Mahotsav. Do you think judiciary is really independent? I see that you have a piece of paper. Uh, 
very well prepared and well thought out questions. Yeah. And they did as I still say, I come to you. Independence from what was we? Independence from political influence? Independence from irrational thoughts? Independence from irrelevant uh, forces? Irrelevance from financial, uh, independence from financial corruption? Independence from what? You have to be more specific in your question. I think what you have in mind is independence from interference. Yes. Well, external interference. You know, I got into a lot of trouble when I said judges don't drop from heaven. I think I told Z, Z News yeah. uh, uh, about a year back when uh, somebody asked me about judicial corruption. I said, judges don't drop from heaven. I'm telling you the same thing. Again, judges don't come from heaven. They are part and parcel of today's uh, contemporary society. Influence, yes. Some judges may have influence. But by and large, I don't think uh, that's a reality. You know, a case can go this way, you know, I'm little handicapped. I have a habit of raising my leg. Uh, you know, uh, a case can have two sides, two legs. It can go this way, it can go that way. If it goes this way, people who think that way say, oh, he has been influenced. If it goes this way, the other side will say he has been influenced. So, to say that judges are influenced are not independent, I don't think would be a very correct statement. Exceptions may yeah, always be there. Right. I would, I would actually ask you this question, Mr. Gogol, because the undercurrent of tension between the executive and the judiciary, uh, there has, it has been there always. Now, now we, are, we are seeing this collegium debate. Uh, where the government has said that uh, you, you know the, the decision to have a collegium to decide on the appointment of judges. Now, the law minister, Kiran Riju, says that he has been quoted as saying that the collegium system is alien to the constitution. That means, indirectly, we can interpret it as saying that the collegium is unconstitutional. Uh, so, there is this controversy about how the judges should be appointed. Your thoughts? The answer to that is very simple. Rightly or wrongly, 11 or 13 judges of the Supreme Court, no, I think the number is this in the second judge's case, interpreted the Constitution in a particular way to say that although the Constitution does not expressly provide for it, this is what the constitutional interpretation should be. If the Supreme Court is entrusted to the task of interpreting the Constitution and the Supreme Court has done so by saying that the collegium system is what is a constitutional contemplation. Right? It is certainly not unconstitutional. You may agree with it, you may disagree with it, but the view taken is not unconstitutional. Therefore, I don't think it is very correct. I don't agree with the law minister uh, when he says that the collegium system is unconstitutional. So you back the collegium? You support, support the collegium system? Beg your pardon? Do you support the collegium system? No, it's not a question of my supporting or your supporting the collision. It's a, it's a system that has been evolved by a constitution bench of the Supreme Court as a part and parcel right. of the constitution. You may agree with the view, you may disagree with the view, but that is the law. And if that is the law, that law must be respected. There are hundreds of laws, there are hundreds of judicial opinions I may personally disagree with. Does it cease to be the law because I think that the law should be different? No, it does not. That's the discipline. We may agree with something, we may disagree with something, but we, even if we disagree, we have to res respect what we disagree with. Recently, you were also there when judges openly differ and hold press conferences. Uh, you know, that's quite interesting for people outside to watch. Are you talking about the press conference of January 2018 where I was uh, uh, a party? Yes. Well, I hope it doesn't ever happen again. I have said it. 
I hope uh, it's a one time. This is not supposed to go to the place. No. There is a Bangalore Declaration of Basic Values. Judges don't talk to the press or the whole day office. That's why you have the Chief Justice of India on the last working day always talks to the press, not before that. But exceptions in life, exceptions in this world, yeah. do occur. Take the January 2018 episode as one of those instances. And uh, let's hope it doesn't have to happen again. That's all. Now, now again, coming safety to another issue, is it okay to expect reservation for a judges? I'm asking you this question because a parliamentary panel recently said, uh, recently observed that there has to be social diversity in the judiciary, like appointment of more judges belonging to scheduled class, scheduled tribes, other backward classes. Uh, what do you think? Well, uh, certainly if uh, particular sections of the society are not represented, we should try and give them representation, but this should not be at the cost of quality. Merit. Say, say on a scale of 20, if you are looking for 20 out of 20, that's very good. But for an unrepresented section of the society, you can come down to 18, but you can't come down to 5. Therefore, by all means, give representation to the unrepresented, but don't compromise on quality. Don't compromise on quality. That is that is important. Uh, now you see, do you have objections to judges declaring their assets, just as the politicians do before contesting an election, for example? Oh no, no, no! I have no objection. I was the first one to declare my assets because I had no assets. <laughs> so, so, but, but there are people in the judiciary. You'll be embarrassed. I must be to see my assets. I have no assets. I have no problems. Why should there be any hesitation? If you have acquired something through your hard work, show it to the world. If you should be proud of it. You should be proud of the fact that I've earned so many crores through my practice. And I yeah. paid my tax on it. And of course, be a very interesting thing. Um, I pay more taxes today on my private work than I ever did as a judge. I think the tax I paid last year is much more than what I paid uh, as taxes for the last 10 years as a judge. <laughs> I, find, I find that I was, whenever I meet the finance minister, I, I will request that bring down the, bring down the taxation level. 42% uh, with surcharge is too much. And it's 42%. For every 100 rupees you earn, you pay 42 rupees to the government. But you see, China, China has embarked onto the uh, new world of what is called digital justice. Uh, now, when cases are heard and disposed of by mobile courts on the popular social media site called WaveChat, now, would you consider this weird? Or do you think this can be experimented by us in India, considering that? 15 million cases are pending. But, uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, you mentioned that WeChat. 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 Mobile WeChat. justice. Yeah. WeChat is something like WhatsApp. It's a messaging platform. Yeah. Right. Where yes. we, which you use not only to uh, settle cases, you use that uh, also to order food from the restaurant. And you have, uh, buy your groceries also. There's a there's a um, particular you know um, part of that uh, platform uh, which is being used uh, for solving legal disputes. Uh, some mobile courts they call it China Mobile Court or the China Mobile yeah. Court, which has received uh, great encouragement and help from the Supreme Court of China. Yeah, they have been doing it quite many, but uh, that mechanism has its limitations. Should we try or should we not try that in India? Because there's always have limitations. <coughs> it's, electronic, it, it's electronic evidence. Internet evidence. It's not physical evidence. That mechanism is very good to solve, solve certain disputes. 
certain kinds of disputes, like consumer disputes, not disputes where the facts are heavy. You know, converting um, uh, physical evidence into electrical evidence is uh, a very tricky proposition. And uh, there's another problem that China is facing. The face of the defendant is unknown. His identity is unknown. Is not known, and uh, that's uh, dangerous. So it's good, but it has its limitations. It's good, but it has its limitations. No, in a related manner, you know, Mr. Uh, Chogoy, our prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, has been emphasizing that we should do away with archaic and obsolete laws, and already. 1,500 such archaic and obsolete laws have been done away with and 32,000 compliances have been done away with. Uh, now what does this mean? Where this old law, the colonial hangover that the previous governments in India just get quiet and failed to sort of uh, eradicate, failed to do away with? Was we don't blame one particular government and praise another particular government. Don't do that. I'm praising one particular government and blaming the others. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. I won't do it. A government is a government. What are these laws that have been found to be obsolete and repeated? I'll give you one or two examples. There was a law which governed a control performance in the theatre. 100 years old. You know, the Britishers even control the theatre. You can't have uh, everything coming on theatre. So there was a law which governed the theatre. Theatrics. That was the thing. Yeah. There was a salt cess act. Well, coming 50 years old. Why was it repeated? The cost of uh, collecting the cess. The tax was more than the says. <laughs> so, obsolete laws have no meaning. They should go. And therefore, I don't, I don't think I'll give any marks to any government for doing away with unnecessary laws. Be it the Narendra Modi government, be it the XYZ government. Old laws which have no meaning have to go. That is what has been done. Why are you giving any marks to that? 1,500 laws have been done away with. Uh, Justice Gobert, can you, can you name one law that you want to be done actually right now? Oh, uh, that Just is, one. The, that is a very loaded question. And uh, that's a uh, question is very difficult. But uh, yes, there are a huge number of laws that needs to be repealed, but the process of repeal is nowhere to be seen. That's all that I can say. You know, I am terribly scared of this thing called the contempt of court. But now that you are sitting with me, uh, I'm a little confident. <coughs> you know, these words really scare me, everyone, you know, just me. Could you enlighten us on the scope and ambit of the courts? power of contempt and the situations which will justify its use. Because we have oh don't do this and you will draw the contempt of court, don't speak this, don't show this, don't do this. So what do you think? What are the courts and the tree? That again is a very loaded question. The, the correct answer would make would make me hugely unpopular with the judges. But uh, I'm not I have never run a popularity contest in my life. Was me and the audience, don't ever be afraid of contempt. You know, I've been a judge, I was a judge for about 19, 20 years. I sentenced only one man. I sentenced only one man who happened to be a high court judge for contempt. Contempt is something that you see but if you look at it a little more intently it vanishes. Content is 
uh, something uh, is one of the archaic laws, perhaps we should require the consideration as to whether it should be continued to remain, even as a punishment. No. The dignity and the majesty of the court, which the point of law is supposed to uphold, should, according to me, be upheld through other means, not by sending a person to jail. Now, it's, um, at the end of the day, in a, thousand, in a thousand strong crowd, you may have one person who criticizes the judges and the judiciary. But if the judiciary is doing good work, the rest 999 will support it. So you don't have to be afraid of criticism. 